You know, I get asked a lot of questions, but the one I get asked the most is, what is your favorite cocktail? Uh, as you can imagine, answering that kind of an opening question is just impossible. I can't do it. I've got to narrow the field down just a little bit. And so therefore today, I'm going to count down the best gin drinks that I've ever had. Let's go. Nobody wants that. That's terrible. Don't do that. <laughs> Gin, by the way, mixes wonderfully. It's a spirit that really loves to be mixed. Um, I've heard it said that it was developed to be mixed and uh, that's the intention. I don't think history would really bear that one out considering the 18th century gin craze in England where people were just like drinking unrefrigerated gin by the court. Um, really coincides with the advent of gin as we know it. But this is not an episode about the history of gin. I kind of did one of those already a little while back in my What is Gin episode, and there's gonna be a link right below. I don't put these in any sensible order. I don't count them down or up or whatever. I put them together the way I feel like put them together. You know, I just put them together. And this first gin drink that I want to get into, it's my favorite gin cocktail right after this. Look, I love the absolute simplicity of a bowl of cereal in the morning. I'm tired. I got a day ahead of me. I'm hungry. Poor for eight an extremely tempting kickoff of the day. If it doesn't hurt, I'll basically write on top. Dandy, masquerading as a holy bar of a complete breakfast. A clever bit of legalese there. And it's all undeniably delicious, but you know, you can't actually eat that anymore because it's garbage. Until I found Magic Spoon. Mm. Now, this is a commercial, and they sponsored this episode. And yes, thank you, Magic Spoon, for doing so. But here's the thing I am honestly really picky about the stuff I accept. The sponsors on Hazard. Like, I get approached by a lot of snake callers and people with crummy products that I just don't want to support. I was extremely skeptical of Magic Spoon, and maybe I still am, because I had them send me out some to check out before I would agree to do the show with them. I was blown away. I was blown away. Because this stuff tastes exactly like the cereal I grew up with and shouldn't have been eating, or at least my memory of that stuff, but it is not completely garbage. Mm. Zero sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four grams of carbs per serving. Only 140 calories per serving. I tried the Go-Go flavor one first, and in my mouth, it tasted exactly, exactly like a cereal for my youth, whose name I can't mention for legal reasons. I loved it. This fruity is on the money too. A lot of people seem to really love blending the peanut butter and the cocoa. And peanut butter is great. Great. Honestly, I'm just not personally a huge on peanut butter stuff in general. But if you pick up a variety box, <clears throat> if you pick up a variety box, it's a couple of cocoa, fruity, frosted peanut butter. You can try it for yourself and see. Again, I cannot get over the taste of these. They're incredible. Full disclosure. The texture is slightly tiny bit different than you might be used to. Very crunchy though. I think it's great. I just feel like if I didn't mention it, you might be surprised. And I didn't want that to happen. It's not bad. It's good. People ask me a lot for keto-friendly cocktail suggestions. I'm at a loss for that one. But for cereal, Magic Spoon is keto-friendly. It's gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb, and non-GMO if you care about that kind of thing. It's cereal reinvented. They're extremely sure you're going to love it. So sure, in fact. And they will back it with a 100% happiness guarantee. If you want it for any reason at all, I'll give you back your money. So click the link below and use my code at checkout to get five bucks off your order. What flavor are you going to try first? I like this fruity. I like this fruity. Back to the show now. This is number one for me, and I'm going to talk about the Ramos Gin Fizz. According to David Wondrich, this drink above all others, including the Sazerac, is the drink of New Orleans. Um, the Sazerac, it just wasn't really unique to New Orleans or invented there, if that makes any sense. And that's just sort of a fabrication, a bit of marketing. The Ramos Gin Fizz definitely was created in New Orleans in 1888 by bar owner named Henry C. Ramos, who was a very conflicted fella. He was a bar owner in New Orleans in 1888 and also a staunch supporter of the temperance movement. At the time, in 1888, when he created this drink, he called it a New Orleans fizz. It didn't take on the name of its creator until sometime later on. Ramos stopped making them himself on October 27th, 1919, because he could no longer reconcile his personal support of prohibition and the hypocrisy of running his wildly popular Imperial Cabinet Bar. I gotta love a man who's got convictions, you know, just enough convictions to say, now that I've made a lot of money, I'm gonna get out of this industry that I dislike. Now that I've made a lot of money, no sir. Uh-uh, my hands are clean. Mm, I'm out. In its heyday, his Imperial Cabinet Bar and the Ramos Gin Fizz that people were there to drink were so popular that he supposedly employed 20 men who did nothing but assist in shaking, taking a drink started by the bartender and handing it down the shaker line with each 
person shaking for a prescribed amount of time until it got to the end and it was ready to be served. That is something a string is actually famous for. It needs a lot of shaking to be made properly. I'm not really sure what the lower limit is, like what's the minimum amount of shaking you can get away with here, but there is some kind of magic that happens between the egg whites and the heavy cream in the string, and they need to be seriously compounded to do their trick. For the excessive amount of shaking that the string takes, this drink is sort of hated by bartenders. I mean, not to drink, but to make. Uh, if you ever wanted to order one at a bar, you should never assume that you can just order a Ramos Gin Fizz. Unless it's on the menu, which is a different situation entirely. But you know, take a look around, see how busy the place is, and ask politely if the person behind the bar would be willing to make one for you. And then of course, tip very well. Or you could just make your own, like I'm about to right here. So get your shaker. Shake out. Get your shaker out and add to it a half an ounce of simple syrup. Now we need a half an ounce of lemon juice. Ounces to milliliters, by the way. Basically, even though this isn't 100% scientifically accurate, for the purposes of cocktails and bartending, uh, we would say that an ounce is 30 mils. A half an ounce is 15. A quarter, I say, is eight mils, you know, because I don't think a half a milliliter really is worth worrying about. I just round up a little bit. And this drink calls for both citruses. I also need a half an ounce of lime juice. You got to get that lemon lime combo to make a proper Ramos gin fizz. Half an ounce of lime. Now it takes three dashes of orange blossom water. Don't try to use orange bitters. It's a completely different ingredient. You should be able to find orange blossom water online or in a pretty decent grocery store. I'm gonna put a link to an Amazon listing for what I usually use, which is called Cortas, and it's good. It's not very expensive either. I happened to have run out when I was getting ready to shoot this one. So I had to go look around and I found out that my grocery stores in my area are not that decent anymore. I had to go to like Italian cooking specialty store to find a tiny little two ounce bottle of this stuff. And that's because apparently it gets used in making certain traditional Italian cookies. I didn't know that. I think of it mostly as something that shows up in um, like, I think it's a Middle Eastern cooking ingredient, uh, if I'm not mistaken, or North African. Uh, I could be somewhat off on that. But yeah, uh, orange blossom water, really good stuff to have uh, if you're making your own syrups anyway. Three dashes, three drops of orange blossom water. A powerful flavor component, right? Really mm, potent stuff. And also, what does it taste like? What does it smell like? Uh, I'm pretty sure that this is the flavor profile that Fruit Loops was aiming for. <laughs> now I need an ounce of heavy cream. I have this organic heavy cream right here. I don't know what I think about these bottles. I bought these a little while ago. I haven't put them on the show yet, but maybe, we'll, maybe they're the way to go. Yeah, that's the idea. We want a, the interaction here between acid, fat, and, and protein, which is coming now. So now I need one egg white. If you think about it, Ramos's temperate leanings are really showing here because this is setting up a lot like an advanced like soda fountain type drink until we get into two ounces of gin, which I'm going to add right now. I need two ounces of gin. For this Ramos gin fizz, I'm going to use my, apparently my last two ounces of Ford's gin. I got to re-up, which I will do actually over at Curiata.com. If you're looking to pick up any of the bottles I use on the show, drink.curiata.com has most of the United States covered. Uh, they can send it to you right in the mail. I have a collection over there at drink.curiata.com uh, in accordance with a partnership I have going on with them. So if you're looking to pick up something specific that I use on the show, or you just don't want to make a trip to the liquor store, or you have a liquor store around you that's not very well equipped or well stocked, uh, check out drink.curiata.com. I think you'll be surprised by how much of the U.S. is covered and if they're not covering your areas yet, uh, well, they're working on it. And so I would check back or see if there's a mailing list they can get you on. Anyway, I'll put a link down below. Uh, you can pick up any of these bottles over there. Now I'm going to dry shake this like I would with pretty much anything that has an egg white in it. You got to be careful when you dry shake because it's the cold ice in your shaker that really helps it seal. And so this is the most dangerous shake you can do. This is the one that's going to blow out on you. Now I'm going to add my ice to this and shake it again. One big. One cracked. Some people ask me, why do I do that? Um, really comes from this like uh, <laughs> experiment that Dave Arnold did. He's a pretty famous bartender where he concluded that that was the most optimal configuration for your ice to be in. And I figured since I have that ability, why not? I mentioned, by the way, that this takes an ounce of heavy cream. If you're in the UK, I think they call that double cream. It's the same idea. Some write-ups for this one will call for shaking to completion. That is until all the ice is gone. Depending on your ice, you might need to, but frankly, that's gonna take me a very long time. So I'm just gonna shake the dickens out of it. I'm gonna shake this thing like crazy uh, for as long as I can possibly stand it because the more I shake this, the better this drink should work. And I might take some breaks. <laughs> if I had a line of shaker men, I might be passing it along. <laughs> I'm not in the shaker shape I once was. 
I don't know the science about this, but we're doing something here with the egg white and the heavy cream and the acid, right? And it just takes a lot of work to get it to work right. <sighs> I'll strain that straight into a Collins or a highball glass, something tall and skinny. No ice, that's what makes uh, a fizz usually doesn't get served on ice, right? And now that gets topped up with uh, some seltzer. I'm gonna actually charge this seltzer up a bit more just because it won't hurt it now. Using my I Drink Mate, my favorite home seltzer maker. If I did this right, I should be able to get this like really tall column of froth that will extend past the edge of my glass, but I didn't. Mine just boils over. So I didn't shake it long enough, in truth. My Ramos Gin Fizz is not really up to stuff. This should be a column of thick, solid, heavy cream. However, the taste will be great. Sometimes these get garnished, by the way. I think, honestly, it's unnecessary. Uh, and so here we go. This is a Ramos Gin Fizz. It's so delicious. Oh my God. It's like sticking your straw into a lemony, limony, orangey, little puffy cloud like the texture of it is just so silky and creamy, but light and just like it floats. I mean, this is an unbelievable, it's, it's almost like, like drinking a cloud. Like it has that kind of a vibe to it. Yeah. It's definitely not aerated all the way through. Honestly, better ones might be, but it has such air to it. And it's not like you're gulping air. It is floaty. I don't know how else to describe it. That lemon, lime, cream, orange blossom, oh God, really works phenomenally well with a London dry gin. The juniper forward citrus notes of a gin just re really works beautifully in this cocktail. I really think honestly, this is one of the heights of the art of mixology, it, it, maybe not mine, although my straw is standing up, so it's not totally without merit, like as good as it gets. It's an absolute delight of a drink. There's so much transformation going on in it. The history behind it has real pedigree. This is an older drink, it's from the 1888. And the fact that it can only really be arrived at by this specific process, this excessive shaking, which I guess I didn't shake enough. I never do, it seems. I'm impatient and tired and lazy. It's a delicious drink. It has so much artifice in it, but it's necessary to its pro end product. Like there's nothing here that doesn't need to be here, like the work even. It rings every bell in a way that almost no other cocktail really comes close. It is a perfect cocktail. So few of these I think exist. Although my, again, my rendition is not perfect. Dangerously drinkable. <laughs> well, I messed up. I definitely should not have finished this drink, but damn it, I just, it's too good. Uh, up next, I'm gonna be taking my cues from the golden age of sale and taking a look at a a genteel sort of officer's drink. Hmm? So this is a drink that actually came to me pretty recently. In fact, if you've been watching the show for a little while, you probably even saw my first encounter with it when I did an episode about the Gimlet and how to drink like a sailor. But despite it being a drink I only recently had my own discovery with, I was instantly smitten. It instantly became a favorite of mine. Uh, actually, in that episode, I specifically said that I preferred it over gin and tonic and that the tonic was dead to me and... Yeah, maybe. There's a caveat there, and that's that um, the perfectly ideal magic version of this drink is based on Jeff Morgenthaler's recipe for a homemade lime cordial. I made the cordial in that episode. It's a combination of uh, 250 grams of sugar, the zest of two limes, uh, an ounce and a half of fresh lime juice, and about 25 grams of citric acid and 235 milliliters of hot water. Toss the whole thing into a blender till the sugar is dissolved, and then strain that and bottle it. Uh, and have some right here. His gimlet formula also favors the gin slightly uh, over the more standard half and half approach, going for two ounces of London Dry and an ounce and a half of this lime cordial. Anyway, let's make this drink. I need an ounce and a half of cordial, of this lime cordial, without getting too deep into the weeds on this. Like traditionally, traditionally, gimlets were made with lime cordial, which is actually a product produced by Rose's Roses, Roses Lime Cordial was like the product that put roses on the map. They're probably more well known for grenadine now, but, and I think maybe other companies are making it too, but they actually pioneered the process. And I think that the recipe has changed a lot over the years because now the primary ingredient is high fructose corn syrup, which nobody really likes that much. It's become the thing to do to omit lime cordial in favor of lime juice and sugar and make a kind of a gin sour or a gin, uh, a gin daiquiri, right? If you try that, and I did in that episode, it doesn't really have the same 
bite, honestly, uh, and that's why Jeff came up with this, that the cordial does. So he came up with this recipe for his own cordial, and I thought that it was the bee's knees. It just really kind of blew my mind. I brought a few different gins out here. Um, I think my intent was to use Plymouth because of the roots, um, the navel roots between Plymouth and, um, and this drink. And also because we're mixing, and this has a tiny bit more alcohol in it than the Gordons, but I think the Gordons would have been fine too. So two ounces of this. Uh, certainly like a Navy Strength gin or something like that uh, would be fine as well. Maybe even better. I just don't happen to have a bottle on hand. Um, but Plymouth is accessible. Great gin to have. Uh, it's a little bit different from a London Dry style. Honestly, in my like, you know, what is gin episode, we, we do a side-by-side -side comparison and just barely you can pick out the differences. You know, a, a Plymouth gin has a slightly rootier flavor than a junipery flavor. It's just a little bit different, but certainly works here very well. And that's it. All we need to do now is stir that and strain it. We need to put ice on it and stir it and strain it. That perfect crack cleavage plane there. I've gotten weird comments. Sometimes people think that they look at something and they think they know how it works. And so I've had people tell me that this teardrop is there to help you crack ice. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. There's nothing better than the, a spoon for cracking ice. People always ask me, how do you crack your ice? Um, so a spoon is this particular spoon, by the way, a bar spoon is perfectly designed for that because no matter how accurate you are with it, you're always focusing your strike into a very small point, right? Uh, the weight at the other end uh, of a teardrop style thing, this is a cylinder. So it extends that across a longer area. Whereas this, as by virtue of being a parabola, can only make contact in one very focused point. And the other thing about that too, is you notice it doesn't take a whole crazy swing. It just takes the right amount of force, dead center, right onto it. And you start setting up fractures through it. When I have to use a tablespoon in my kitchen at home, upstairs because I don't have, these are all down here and I'm too lazy to go downstairs. It's a pain in the butt. Using a regular spoon stinks. You need the extra velocity that you get from this length. You know, you'll sting yourself if you accidentally miss, but you really won't hurt yourself. If you had a tablespoon with that kind of weight and this handle, oh my God, it would <laughs> be brutal. The, the momentum then would change. And it doesn't take much. And once you get a feel for your ice, the density of it, the size, you get an idea of, oh, this is exactly the right blow to use because of the harmonics of this particular ice crystal. Um, you can repeat it pretty accurately time and time again. This particular spoon is not my favorite. I have a lot of spoons that just happened over the years because it's a little bit too long for me. It's just a little bit too long. The balance point is too high. So I'm, see how my elbow is up? It should be more level. And if I come down here, it's like really unwieldy. It's not my favorite spoon. Anyway, a digression about spoon stuff. We have a uh, Nick and Nora. Perfectly elegant glass for this. Although it may be a little undersized. We'll see. You'd be surprised though. That bowl gets big at the top. It can really eat a lot of liquid. Do you garnish a gimlet? You could. I don't think it's necessary. If I were to garnish it, what would I use? I mean, maybe a lime wheel or something, you know, or a lime wedge even. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. You know why? Because this drink is done. Putting a lime wedge or something on there implies, hey, maybe you want to add more lime to it. You don't. This is perfect. Let's uh, see how this gimlet came out. The one thing I will say about this, um, Jeffrey Morgenthaler's process for making this cordial. I strained it through a fine sieve, but not like cheesecloth. There are little bits of um, blended, destroyed uh, lime zest throughout it. Could you get the rest of it out? Yeah. I haven't tried it though, because I don't know how it would affect the flavor. I, I personally say, just go with it, just leave it in there. Oh, it's so good. Oh my God. It is so bracing, totally worlds apart from the last drink we did from the uh, Ramos Gin Fizz. The Ramos Gin Fizz is comfortable. It's like, oh, hello, let's get cuddly. It's a very cuddly drink. This drink is like a cold sea breeze across your face, you know. It, it wakes you up. It makes your mouth water. The pungent, bitter, biting acidity of it causes all of your salivary glands to just go whoosh, activate, which I personally, when a cocktail can do that, I really like that. I personally really like that. It makes the drink sens um, very sensorial. Sensorial? Sensational? Sensi. Sensi. A really excellent balance of sweet and tart and, and bitter because of the, the acid, the extra bitterness from the peel that the cordial has in it. It's like a sour, 
but not. It has a different bite to it than a sour. Like if you were to try to compare this to a daiquiri or even a gimlet that was made with fresh lime juice, it's different. They don't have that cold water bracing hoof sea spray and a Beaufort eight day when the, the steel is, the sky is steel kind of thing. Well, I hope you will try it and find out for yourself, honestly. Uh, it's definitely a drink worth making by far. Uh, one of my favorite gin drinks. Two absolute apexes of the form here, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and they're historic. Because I do think that this is what a, um, a gimlet would have been like in the age of sale when Rose's Lime Cordial was a little bit more natural in its ingredient um, list, right? And, and I mean a little bit, because like the Victorians used artificial everything, but this is the only way to make a gimlet. And when you make it this way, you will be sold. It is a gimlet. This is a cocktail for the ages. It's so good. Up next, I wanna talk about a drink I consider to be a modern classic and an absolute favorite of mine from one of my favorite bars that is sadly no longer in operation. All right, I wanna talk about Audrey Saunders Earl Grey Martini. I talked about this drink about a year ago in another episode, and I'm gonna quickly rehash that Pegu Club was one of my favorite bars ever. It's a magic place, uh, just utterly comfortable and welcoming, and just always a joy to be in. Uh, Audrey Saunders opened it in 2005, and it quickly became one of the bright spots in the cocktail firmament of New York City, and thus the world. But sadly, Pegu Club is one of the many amazing places that uh, COVID took from us. Though I look forward to patronizing whatever Audrey comes up with next. Uh, I'm sure it'll be great if she, when she opens her next bar, I will be there with bells on. Audrey had a stated goal of getting people to drink gin again, because in 2005, vodka was still king. Uh, and to that end, she developed a showstopper of a drink she called the Earl Grey Martini. And I won't lie, uh, this isn't like a foundational drink or really a bog standard basic that you just need to memorize or something. But this episode is about my absolute favorite gin drinks. And to that end, uh, this drink is tops. I will pause to say that it's not really a martini, it's a sour. And further that the martini isn't on this list. The martini's not on this list. Look, I like a martini from time to time when I'm in a particular mood, but would I ever call it one of my absolute favorite drinks? No, I really just wouldn't. I did an episode on the martini a long while back. I presented two historic formulations for it and I stand by those. In general, I like a two to one ratio martini made with a dry French vermouth and two dashes of orange bitters and a lemon twist. I like olives fine. I just don't like them in my drink. I, I think that they make it oily. I'll take them on the side. A lot of people tell me, hey, you made that martini with too much vermouth. I didn't, <laughs> I did not. You're allowed to like a martini with however much vermouth you like in it. But you should be aware at the very least that historically a martini has two to one or more, maybe even 50-50 ratio to vermouth. And that the idea that dryness describes how much vermouth is in the martini is actually a post-war phenomenon. Uh, it comes from people not knowing where the term dry martini came from, but basically the martini predates the advent of London dry gin. So they were originally made with gin or Hollands, as it would have been, might have called. And when you wanted one with dry gin, you had to specify a dry martini. Um, it was only during World War II that <laughs> France being occupied by Nazis uh, made vermouth really hard to get and tastes turned away from vermouth. And the reason you don't like the vermouth in your martini is because your vermouth is oxidized. You should put it in the fridge and preserve it with a wine preserver like Private Preserve, which I'm actually gonna put a link to in the comment below. It's like $10 for a can of this stuff, lasts forever. The only problem with it is that it's nothing in there but argon gas and maybe some nitrogen. Heavy gases that create a boundary layer to keep oxygen off of your liquids. The problem with that is that the can feels empty somebody will throw it away if you let them. If someone's cleaning up your house when you don't want them to, they're gonna pick that up and throw it in the garbage. I will probably revisit the martini in a matrix in the coming months at some point. Um, but that sounds like fall content to me. And also, even though we just talked about the martini a lot, this is not about the martini. This is about the Earl Grey martini. Now to make this drink, you need to make an infusion of Earl Grey tea into London dry gin. I have my infusion here. Uh, this is actually the same bottle I made when I did that episode. It's shelf stable. It'll last, you know, forever. This is nothing more than about a ratio of four tablespoons of loose leaf Earl Grey tea. I used Twinings, nothing fancy. 
per uh, 750 milliliter bottle of London Dry. I used a half a bottle here. Put them together, shake it up, let it stand for two hours, and strain it well to get all the little tea particles out. Maybe use a coffee filter for this one if you really want to get those the dust off the tea out. Now that you've got that, let us shake up this delectable treat. And the first step is actually to prepare the glass because this drink gets a sugar rim. I think that you can skip the sugar rim, but Audrey was going for something really accessible here when she made this drink. She wanted something that she could convince people to come in off the street from streets of New York, people who were uh, at that time really into watching Sex in the City and drinking Cosmos. She wanted them to stop drinking <laughs> vodka so much and take a look at gin. There's a sugar rim here to make the drink fun. I think in the spirit of that, we should do it. You want, when you rim something, you wanna make sure that you stay to the outside. You don't wanna go on the inside. And that's why I do this instead of just like plunging it in. Particularly with this glass, plunging it in would do nothing. It would only be able to rim the inside because of the shape of the mouth of the glass. Um, do that first and then that'll dry. And when you rim something, by the way, use citrus. It forms kind of a glue that water won't. Water doesn't really work so good. So I'm gonna add to this an ounce of simple syrup. And now I need three quarters of an ounce of lemon juice. Now I need an ounce and a half of my infused gin. I think when I made this, boy, I don't remember. I know that at Pegu Club, they used Tanqueray as far as I know. I think I might've used Ford's when I made this. There we are, infused gin. And now one egg white. Oh yeah. If you don't like egg whites because you're vegan or you just are put off by the concept, uh, you can use aquafaba, but please, I beg you, do not simply omit this without a suitable replacement. The drink will be ruined without something to do what the egg white does. Uh, let's give it a dry shake. And now I will get some ice and shake again. Take your prepared glass, get any little bits of sugar out of there and strain away. Twist a bit of lemon over it, although I don't think it's necessary. So if you want to skip this, be my guest. Maybe make a little garnish out of that. And there we have an Earl Grey martini, a lasting testament to the inventiveness and genius of uh, Audrey Saunders. Oh, what a delight of a drink. You get mm, this light, lemony, frothy, sour right away. Like a sour, it's a familiar thing. It's like a, a good sour. You get that egg white frothy lightness with the sweet and the tart, and that's up here. And then this base comes up of Earl Grey tea. And the Earl Grey tea brings the bergamot um, orange and, and these tannins, these earthy rooty notes that are here because of the egg white, I think, moderated. They're bound so that instead of getting bitter, like you normally can with a tea that's oversteeped, you actually just get this entirely uh, wonderful uh, flavor evolution. It is an inspired, straight from the muses, a work of art of a drink. It was that called cream tea? When you have tea with like a uh, clotted cream on the side? Like a uh, cream tea with more lemon. Like it has a lemonade-ish, lemony, lemon, yeah, like a, like almost an Arnold, Arnold Palmer because it has a lemon and tea thing going, but to compare this to a Arnold Palmer is a crime. This is a um, unbelievably delectable cocktail. <laughs> Such perfect harmony of flavors and balance here um, and textures with the, even the grains of sugar, which have this you know granular gritty texture contrasting with the, the smooth, creamy frothiness of the egg white sour type combination that you get. Absolute uh, uh, apex of the form. And modern, two classic uh, gin drinks that I think um, are exemplars of the pantheon of gin. And one modern version, which to me uh, really showcases everything you can do with the spirit um, and when it's done well. Yep, that's my three favorite gin drinks. I mentioned a little earlier in this episode my preferred recipe for a martini uh, and in the interest of kind of covering also gin basics here, I should mention how to make a Tom Collins. It's not like one of my favorite drinks or anything, but they're fine. I've never exactly minded having one. I was like, oh, Tom Collins. <laughs> um, it is my wife's favorite drink though. And generally uh, when I do wind up having one, it's out of laziness because I'm making one for her and I may as well make one for me. Very simple drink. I, I do <laughs> an ounce of lemon juice half an ounce of simple syrup, two ounces of London Dry, build it in a glass of rice, give it a stir until it's cold and mixed, 
add carbonated water to top it up. That's a, that's a, how you make a Tom Collins. Well, that's it guys. Those are my three favorite gin drinks. I, my favorite gin drinks. Are they the most important gin drinks? No. Are they the first three gin drinks you should know? No. Are they the best gin drinks in the world? That's a subjective question. I can't answer it. Are they my best gin drinks? They are. And if that's of use to you, I hope that this episode was fun. I can't imagine. I mean, I've not yet encountered a gin based cocktail better than any of these three top notch stuff. If you're looking to pick up one of the gins I'm using here, uh, whether it's aviation, which I think is actually really fantastic gin, beef eater, Ford's Plymouth, Gordon's, uh, Tanqueray, which I'm all out of, which tells you all you need to know about Tanqueray. It's, the standard, right? I just happen to be out. You know, if they're not available for you at your local liquor store or you just don't feel like going there, check out drink.curiata.com in the link in the pinned comment below. Uh, we have a partnership going with them. There are, uh, all of these spirits should be available uh, for delivery if you're in the Curiata service area, which is expanding all the time. So if you're not currently, it's worth keeping it in mind and checking later. Thank you so much for watching. I'm on Twitter at how to drink. I'm on Instagram at how to drink. I'm on Patreon at patreon.com slash how to drink. If there are any parts of this episode that uh, were a little too saucy for <laughs> prime time, they're going to wind up in a special features kind of cut over at Patreon where you can see the deleted scenes. And uh, I'll see you guys very soon with another episode of How to Drink. I think I've said everything I need to say. Mmm. 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 Mmm.